Okay, it's um, from the start. Welcome. I'm glad you're all here. It's my first time to present this uh, before such an international audience, um, but I'm glad to do it. Um, when this uh, seminar started, uh, Mr. Hasta Mustafa said, well, you're the coaches, you're uh, very important, and I'm very glad that we also have uh, one presentation that concerns itself uh, with the coach. That's uh, what this is all about. Um, first of all, I, uh, I found out, I've uh, asked Paul, I think, no, I don't know where, he's over there, to uh, send you three questions uh, to get some kind of inventory about what you think about when we talk about coaching, what are the issues that you uh, struggle with. Uh, for everybody who has uh, taken the trouble uh, to send it back to me, I will answer these questions via email because I have your emails uh, gotten through Paul. Um, because I don't know exactly if your questions will be answered in this uh, presentation. But again, I hope if, uh, if you have any questions uh, during this, you don't have to wait until the end. Just ask them. We have people with micros that can, uh, can help you, and we make this a little bit uh, interactive. Um, there was one question that was sent to me in Italian. I, I don't understand. Is that person here now? No. Okay. I'll have to translate it because the French uh, questions Paul already translated for me. Okay, what, what I'm going to talk about, we have seen now for two days uh, beautiful presentations, very good teams uh, who have shown us a lot. Um, but we have, as we have in most of our education as coaches, we talk about the technique, we talk about tactics, we could talk about the rules, we talk about everything, and we always forget to talk about the coach. So we never talk about us and, and what about our development and, and how do we do it. Um, I, another part of my work is I work for the Johan Cruyff Institute. He is not a handball player. He thought he, he knew handball. but uh, And he, he, he said this, I cannot coach someone else if I not, cannot coach myself first. It's what we do uh, if I talk about coaching. We will we'll continue with this uh, uh, during the presentation. Um, I am part of the equation. If I coach a team, we have seen different coaches working. Uh, we have seen two coaches working with Ponto Cobo. It's the same team, but we've seen different ways of handling this team, dealing with the, uh, the, the, the topics that you, you're working with. So you see different results. And it's not about uh, what you like better or what you like more, but what is effective. We, we, we try to develop players to play handball more effectively. Um, but how much do we work on our own effectiveness? Is our coaching very effective? If we have a game and, and we have uh, what we consider to have bad referees, um, is what we do then all very effective uh, in our play for, for the team? Um, so we have to... to consider, okay, who am I as a coach? And these are two tips. When I started, I, I'm now a, a professional handball coach since, uh, I think, 91. And when I started, I, you always get a lot of advice as a coach, people who tell you uh, what to do or what not to do. And these were two things that I still remember. And, and first, it was my, my last uh, national team coach. And he told me, make sure that every decision you make is really your decision. Because your decisions as a coach will always be questioned. Uh, you will always make uh, decisions under pressure. Um, and if it's not really your decision, you will find it very hard to, to uh, stay upright and defend them. And another one said to me, he was also a coach I knew from, from the junior national team and from a club. And he said, remember that everybody, if you're coaching, everybody must think you're angry but you never must be angry. Um, and I think if you take these two uh, advices, I think it's, it's, uh, it comes to the essence of, of uh, coaching and my own development. It was in the beginning when they told me, I said, yes, okay, of course, uh, thank you for the advice. And I did the same thing most of us do when we get advice, we put it somewhere and we forget about it. And, um, but in my own development, I found out, okay, um, if you want to make a decision that is really your decision, first you have to think about how do I feel about it. You have seen now for two days a lot of presentations, and I think 
my question to you is, why are you here? Anybody? Change experience with colleagues. Okay. To learn something. Okay. Anything else? Because I think you have come here. What you say is very good. You come here for your own development. You want to improve as a coach, as a trainer, uh, somebody who works with athletes. Now you have presentations, and every coach or trainer who has presented something has given you the opportunity to ask questions. I am sure, because we have 300 coaches here, that a lot of you have had questions after a presentation. But just a few of you have asked them. And I would like to ask you why. If you are here for your own development, you have the chance to ask questions. Why don't you? It was very brave to speak up <laughs> at once. But just think about it. You don't have to answer it. You have a question? <laughs> no, okay. Um, because if you, if you want to develop yourself, and that's the way I coach with my team, with my teams, I tell to my players, if you want to develop, if you want to perform, it's your responsibility. My responsibility is to deliver good practice, to give you good training, give you good advice or everything that I do. My quality is my responsibility. Your quality is your responsibility. So if you want to develop here, do so. You can use this, uh, these four days as a kind of reunion. I've seen a lot of faces just now uh, that I haven't seen for maybe 25 or 30 years. It's nice to meet people, but if I'm here for my development, I should act like I'm here for my development. So be active instead of passive. In the questions that I received uh, in the email, a lot of the questions were about what should I do, how should I do, should I do it? And I think, first of all, you had to think about why, why do I do things? What is the objective? What, what do I want to achieve? Why do I do things? And, and, and uh, um, I think when we look at the national team of the Netherlands, we have uh, created, uh, one of my colleagues who, who had done a lot of work with it, Ton, is here. We have created uh, a plan of how we want to play handball. And there is a reason why we want to do it that way, because it, it suits the Dutch mentality, it suits Dutch qualities, and that's why we do it. But we asked ourselves the question, why? Why do we train the things we do? Why do I coach the way I do? And I think that's a question we should, uh, we should ask ourselves. Is, is anybody here who, who, would, who wants to share with me or with the others why he is a coach or she? Mm -hmm. Anybody? It's difficult to speak. Why? We are all coaches. We are all here to help each other to become better coaches. I would like to, uh, I don't know why. I can tell you why I am a coach. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm a coach. I'm from the Côte d'Ivoire, uh, from Western Africa. And um, I've decided to be a coach because I want to allow young people from very modest areas to gain values, to be part and parcel of society. And that's why I wanted to be a coach, you know, to take the youth and bring them somewhere else, a social type of development. I'll start again. I'll, I'll start again. Okay. Rehearsing is very much part of education. Okay. I'm coming from the Ivory Coast. Uh, no, we're, we're the first to uh, export cocoa. Okay. By the way, anyway, anyway, we do things that are very serious as well. As I was saying, I was saying I decided to be a coach. That's to help young players coming from very underprivileged areas because we convey values much more than sports so that they can be part and parcel of society.
The interpreters would like to tell you that it would be faster if we gave headsets to the speaker. They have you as a coach. But and my question to you would be, and if you succeed, what does it give you? Well, me, the benefits for me is happiness. I'm happy. I'm happy to see them, happy to take young boys and girls and help them. You know, through sports, you know what I do? I juggle with the two nicest verbs in the world, to love people and to help people go up in society, so that society is better in general, to avoid prostitution, uh, delinquency, through sports. This is my happiness. Um, but if you succeed, it makes you happy. Is it? Oui, oui, oui. Okay. Oui. The interpreters would like to tell the English speakers in the room that you could suggest that the speaker should take uh, headsets. I have to tell you why I am a coach. Uh, thank you for this. I think it's the same thing. I'm from a different society. We don't have, I think, the kind of problems that you have in, in Côte d'Ivoire. Um, but for me, I have uh, people, teams, development, performance. That's what makes me, uh, give me energy. What makes me happy if I see people develop, if I see people perform well, um, I get a lot of energy from it. And I've learned that in life you should go there where you get energy and not where it costs energy. So that's why I am a coach and uh, I think this is what keeps me driving uh, even in times when things are not so good or not so easy. Um, and I'm glad to hear, in fact, it's the same for you in different circumstances. And I think if, we, if everybody would ask this question, a lot of the, questions, the answers would be like this, because I love what I do. It's one of the, one of the things uh, on both is, why do you do what you do? Because you love it. Because maybe you're good at it. It serves a purpose. And, and um, in your case, maybe it says the world needs it. That may be more important for you in Cote d'Ivoire than maybe in Holland, where we have a lot of other possibilities to have a good life. Um, the second thing as a coach, um, if you know why you're a coach, then we have seen already a, a lot of different kind of coaches. And, and the next question is, okay, if I, know, if I know why I'm coaching, then I have to ask myself, well, who am I as a coach? What kind of coach am I? Um, if you look at these pictures, which one, which one suits you best? I think you, we all know that if you're coaching a team, and, and uh, you have all these roles. Sometimes you're teaching with a flip over and, and, and telling everybody. Sometimes you're motivating. Sometimes you're yelling at somebody who's, who's not performing the way you'd like to. Maybe not in that manner, but everybody chooses their own way. Some way just point directions. So these are all sides of coaching. And, and you have to know where lies your strength. And we'll get to uh, the point why this is so important. Because if, I think if we go back and we look at these questions, uh, the first one is why am I a coach? I have to know why. Because then from why I am comes the what and the how. Um, then who am I as a coach and why is it important? Because uh, as you've seen, the, the, the teams we have, uh, we have seen here, they respond differently to different coaches. And not every coach will be as effective as the other with this team. And if I want to have results with this team, I have to know their needs. But I also have to know what can I deliver. And I think the journey inside for a coach is as important as the journey outside. And until now, I think a lot of the things we have seen is about the players, is about the game, is about the rules. But I think you will be far more effective as a coach if you also know who you are and why you do the things you do. Uh, and you'll find out if you go into that journey uh, that things are not as easy as you think. So this, uh, well, the people who have seen me coaching, 
uh, I stopped with the national team in October or September. And now the, my successor is Helle Thompson. She's a Danish coach. And the people who have seen her, they've seen two different people on the bench. Even though we have uh, similar ideas on handball, different people, different coaches. And I'm glad the team did well at the European Championships. Well, this is who I am as a coach. I'm, I'm uh, fairly balanced. I'm optimistic. I always believe in good results. Um, I think we can achieve a lot if we work all in the same direction. Uh, I have different ideas, but I work from my head. I mean, Homer Simpson has other things in his mind than I have, but uh, it's still my head that, that rules. And, and one thing that happened with me as a coach, when I started 25 years ago, I had all the answers. When I talked with my players, I told them, do this, do that, uh, move like this, move over there. And I've learned that that's not very effective. We think it works good, but if you look at also uh, modern studies from psychology about learning, asking questions and giving them problems is far more effective in the, in the learning from the players than telling them what to do. If you tell them what to do, they get very obedient. And as long as you're there, as long as this pressure is there, they will try to do what you expect from them. But it has nothing to do with the game or their own ability to make decisions uh, under pressure at important moments. So this was a transition for me, changing from telling what they do to asking, what do you need? But you can only ask what you need if you know what you want to achieve before that. But that's about managing a team. We'll, we'll get to that later. Um, and you'll find out if you ask questions, you not always get answers. Because like today, um, not everybody speaks up even though you're thinking. And maybe you have questions. Maybe you think, well, he's talking bullshit. Um, but still, you don't speak up. The same is when I'm a national coach. You are, you are the one who says to a player, you come to Rio or you don't come to Rio. So if I ask them, well, I think maybe we should do this. How do you think about it? You don't always get an honest answer. You have to work on that to make it safe for the players to speak up and, and really think what they, really tell you what they think. But this is who I am. So I like uh, to be in balance. And why do I like that? Because I have found out that it, when I'm in balance, I make the best decisions. I make the best observations. I can help my team in the best, most possible way. So that was important for me to know. Because also in a game, I also get emotional. I also think something of what happens on court, of decisions of the referees or actions of the players. But I have learned if it affects me on the bench, my level of coaching goes down. And the level of play of my players go down with it. Because we have a strong influence during the game my actions towards referees, you find out that if I start talking to a referee, some of the players also start talking to a referee and they start thinking about the decisions. And they shouldn't be thinking about the decisions, they should be thinking about the game, their performance, their actions. So I have learned to keep balance, to control emotions. That's what's, what the guy said when he said, well, you, everybody must think you're angry, but you must not be angry. That means control your emotions, know what you do, in fact, in any moment of the game. It's not always easy, especially when the stakes are high, when, when you want to achieve a lot. But it's far more effective than letting your emotions uh, take the best of you. Well, optimistic, I always believe that things are possible. This is uh, one thing I've learned, and especially the last eight years, I've coached a, a women's team. Um, for men, it was easier maybe to relate for me, but the women, the things you talk about are almost never the real topic. Uh, but for you, it's the same. If you look at the, the, the presentations we've had, also the practical sessions, you see some exercises, you see uh, a team that is performing well or less well in, in, in things they haven't done before because it's another trainer than they have in their club or exercises they don't know yet. 
But the real topic is what lies behind. Why does the trainer do what he do? We had one uh, question this afternoon for this exercise where the wing came in. I don't know if the, the person is here who asked the question. Then you talk about the exercise. You talk about this situation. But you have to try to think what lies underneath. Because that's important. If you try to talk about uh, managing a team, we'll get to that. You'll find out that the teams you work with have completely different problems in Côte d'Ivoire than I have in the Netherlands or when I worked in Germany. But the principles of how to manage a team are similar. If, and only if you, any of you have been uh, at the presentation of the climbing of the Mont Blanc, uh, that's also a team who wants to achieve a goal as a team. They will meet the same challenges in a different way because it's a different environment, it's a different situation, but the principles underneath are the same. And I, I would invite you to look for those. Not just be here and write down some interesting advices or interesting uh, uh, training exercises, but think about, okay, why? Why is this happening? Why is he doing this? What is, and what is my philosophy? How do I think about handball, about coaching, about improving? Um, and then you'll find there's a, a, a big, uh, the real topic, there's a, there's a lot to work with. Okay. Um, this is what we do. Even as we sit here, uh, we think, we feel, and we act. Even if we don't act, it's still a form of action. And it's same for the players. And now it's, uh, do you have an idea if you want to develop? That means you grow. How do we do that? Anybody? Again, this was a question, so it, maybe... Read something. Okay. Get, get knowledge. Yeah? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, you take information to you. Yeah, okay. Okay, what do you do more? Anybody? Just not, I don't, not just talking to you, sorry. <laughs> Anybody? Actions. You do things, yeah. Exchange. Exchange. Okay, of anything. Information, experience. Okay. So you do things for, yeah. You have to ask a question. Yes, okay. Sorry? Yes, he works. <laughs> <laughs> First, I would like only to say something about um, that you were saying that we are not asking anything. I would like to say that uh, uh, we, as uh, I myself, I try to learn to make questions because we should not make a question when we know the answer, only to um, to confront the person that is here. So I really like to answer something that I really want to know about it first. Um, about how we learn to be a coach, this is really a big challenge. I think the first thing that we must learn to do is to learn to think about it, about what we are doing, to rethink, to look at ourselves, what we are doing, what we are looking for, and to be able to learn every day with every detail. The most difficult thing, thing is to teach someone to learn to think about it. I, have, I do this every day. I really want to learn to think about it, to, to find what is really needed to learn about it. What are the many important things? To be a coach is really, really complex. What should I look for? Uh, how should I select information that is around me every day, every time? in everywhere. This is really the big challenge. That, that's what I want to say because you are just making feel. I was feeling that's what you was okay. able to do with me. Yeah, I was yeah, feeling go. that Thank I you. wanted to act. So that's why yeah. I answered to you. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. That's, that's, that's why the microphone is there. So it's good. Thank you. Um, because when we have players, we all know uh, th this morning we saw physical exercise. If a player engages more in training, they get better. If they work harder in the physical training, if they pay more attention when we do the video analysis, they improve. 
And how big is your engagement for your own development? That's a question that you should also think about. Because if you uh, develop, uh, you want to develop more, you have to engage more. The people who have asked questions will get more out of it than the people who don't. So I would like to challenge you to, to really do this more active uh, and, and uh, search for the answer to the questions. And don't forget to look inside and look into the mirror. It gives you a lot of information. Um, at least it gave me a lot of information. <laughs> Um, so we do a lot with thinking, we have feeling, we are acting, we are doing things. Most of it, we are taught in our educational system to think a lot, and mostly only with one part of the brain. Uh, very analytical, um, the, hmm? critical, yeah, yeah, critical is, that's, that's another issue. Uh, the interesting thing is that we all know that we uh, improve more if we are being praised, if we get uh, uh, compliments. And still, it was interesting to see even before, in the, in, I thought it was a beautiful practice we had uh, in the situation seven against six. The defense, uh, the offense had to run back if they didn't score a goal. That's, you can call it extra training, you can call it punishment, the way you see. But if you do something not good, you get an extra task. Instead of complimenting, it's the way we think is how we've been taught at schools, and it's almost automatically. It's Just to develop them, so that yes. was not critical. The, that it, was bonus, in my opinion. No? So it's for the next time to be better. Yes, it's always the the intention is always development. The intention may be good, even of punishing somebody, of giving of them course. an extra task. How you will call it? Negative but motivation. we know already that compliments, encouragement, empowerment works better. Correct. And should be more in balance. Correct. Uh, and I think we, we, can, we can change that as coaches. But still, it's almost because we have been taught in school, you get 10 questions, and they say 1, 2, 3, 4, wrong, you get 6 points. They don't say 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, good, you get 6 points. No, we, we count what we do wrong and we deduct that from the maximum score. That's how we think, even though it doesn't work. Um, and I think we can change that, and we should change that. And the same thing uh, goes for ourselves. Now it should work again. Okay. So we think a lot, we do a lot, but if you keep it like that, you can, you can uh, look at yourself, what do I do when things go wrong? Do I sit back and start thinking? Or am I becoming very active, doing a lot of things? Or I, am I expressing my feelings? This is what happens. But you grow like this. If you want to grow as a person, as a coach, you have to learn to connect your own feelings with your actions and your thoughts. And get them in line. If you, if you look at the drawing, I... I uh, thought I, I was missing one thing. Anybody noticing it or not? Action. Oh, it's in the bottom. Action. It's about the connection. What we want from our players is that they see something and they act immediately. Um, so that means we need some arrows between thinking and acting. But I'm not so good, so I couldn't change it anymore today. But... Uh, but this is how you grow. Make sure that what you think and what you feel and what you do is connected. Then it makes you more stable. And if you make decisions, it will not be so easy for other people to toss you around. And as coaches, you'll find out in, there are a lot of situations where a lot of people want to take influence on your decisions. They want to tell you what to do, what is good for the club, what is good for the country, what is good for the team, what is good for their child if you work with young people. The parents are a, a nice influence. And if you do this, you get more stable. For, for that, you have to know yourself. The next question as a coach is important. Well, who am I coaching? It was what you said. Well, if I'm a coach in Cote d'Ivoire, I have completely different challenges than when I'm a coach in the Netherlands or in France. It's completely different. So you have to know who am I and who am I coaching? 
what is my team? Because we have seen exercises here when we just took the last presentation. But if you are training uh, the team on, on, on the top left, I think it, it, these exercises will be very difficult. They need other exercises. So it's not just about you. It's about also the people you coach. And think about, OK, how can I transform the exercise we just saw, who was performed by a first league French team, and take the principles from that and use them in my training of nine, 11 years old children whom I want to prepare for this kind of handball. That's what you have to think about. So who am I as a coach is one thing. And who am I coaching is the next question. <coughs> and the interesting thing is if you start talking about and how do I manage my team, all these teams have, uh, I think, Similar things you have to uh, look for in managing the team. This is uh, the habitat of a coach, as I call it. This is, these are people you have to deal with when you're coaching. And if you're uh, coaching a young team at a local club, maybe the circle is not uh, as big. You won't have to deal with the president of the federation, but maybe you have to deal with the president of the club or the president of the, of the junior board. You all, as a coach, have to handle these situations. Um, which one do you find the most difficult? You, you coach youth, national team, and parents are pa the most difficult group. Parents, without a doubt. OK. Yeah. I, I hear some people who agree with you. Yeah, OK. Other difficulties? No challenges. Okay. Because I think it's also the manager from the clubs. Managers. The, at the time, I think this is the problem. Yes. So they are not manager; they are coaching all the time. So, so you, you, yeah, it depends on the manager. Yeah. In my country, it's you, so. yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's it's. Uh, but you see how complex it is. The environment you have to deal with, uh, and and for that, it's important that as a coach. You know who you are. You know what you stand for. And I think most important, I think it was Mr. Covey who said it, you have to be prepared to be fired for the things you believed in. You don't, have, uh, don't let yourself be pushed away because some president or manager or thinks you should do th things differently. So maybe you get fired. But then again, somebody already said, as a coach, you're hired to get fired. So get prepared for that but always stand for what you believe in. So I put them now in, in, a, in a, another perspective. Because when I coach, um, I coach a team of players. What you can't see inside this team circle, there are, depending how big the team is you're coaching, uh, in an adult team you have 16 players. There are 16 more circles in the team. Because a lot of team dynamics only have to do with the, 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 the struggle between team goal, team objective, and individual goals. Uh, and that goes for the players in the team, but also, well, if you talk about the management, they have their own goals. The president has, a, has his own goal. The players have their goal. The, goal, the coach has a goal. And now how do you handle that? And I put them in a circle because I, th I would like to say every circle is a team of its own. And if you want to make the team work well, you have to treat them as such. So if you understand that the team of players is one group you have to manage. But you, staff, and yourself is the next team. And you will see after that if you just think about the objectives you want to achieve with your team, mostly it can be a championship or going up for the next league or winning so many games in a season, that's the goal for your team. That's not the same goal as you need to feel a team as well with your staff. Or if we talk to the manager, if you want to deal with the manager and feel a team with him, you should look for the same objectives you can achieve with him or her. But you do it in a different way because your team, you can also tell. If I was a coach of a national team, well, I select the players. 
and it's easy to pick those who listen to me if I want that. I, I choose, but I can't choose my president. So you'll see there's a different way of relating to these people. And you have to be aware of it, but underneath it's the same. How do I manage my team? This is, uh, in fact, the, the, the way I work um, with any team I work with, no matter if it's, it's small kids or grown-up professionals. If you want to feel a team, um, you need something in common, and that is a common goal. If you don't have a common goal, it's very hard to feel like a team. So this is one of the most important things if you start coaching a team to be clear about the common goal and strategy because it's, it's uh, connected. And how do you do that? How do you do that now with your teams? Anybody? How do you define your objectives for, for your team? Hello. Yes. First of all, you need uh, to know the quality of team. Uh, the quality of players, mm -hmm. and uh, after you can uh, put the objective. For example, I know you, as I was the pl a player for the Romanian national team, so, and um, I was, I uh, saw also your work, so it's uh, unbelievable how the Netherlands team is developed at the last. M 10 years can I see, so from the young age category until senior, so congratulations for that. And I think when uh, 10 years ago you didn't, you didn't put the object, objective for your team to be qualified, to, I don't know, to Olympics games because the time the team was not so good, but now step by step you was in the top every world championship and uh, so, and so you build up also for the team that you can reach some medals but step by step so i think this is first step you can put the objective to be objective with your team and your, with your quality on, at the team so this is my opinion okay so that what you say but thank you for the compliments for the dutch team but <laughs> Uh, um, what you say is okay if you want to uh, define the objectives you have to know the level of your team or what, what they might be able to achieve and who defines that? The players yes? It's the way you do it now I think uh, the, the other I can hear you but the others don't It's not working that's a technique, okay. It's still not working. Okay. Yes? Making the microphone work is his job. It's not your problem. Uh, so she said, well, you have to do it together. Anybody disagree or agree? Somebody does it in a different way? Okay, that's nice. So the players have something to say about the objectives. Um, that's good because it should be their goals, not my goals. But I think I've, I've had a lot of coaches. Uh, and you talked about managers and presidents of clubs and federations. They have their own ideas about the objectives of the team you're coaching. And if you don't get the results they expect, well, they expect you to leave. So it's not always that easy. But how do you do this with your president? Who, has, uh, who works with, with teams where you have to deal with the media, with press? Anybody? Nobody. Because how do you deal with press? How do you become a team with a journalist that might not like you? and he writes for a very influential paper or works for a network. You also have to sit down with him or her and try to work out what is our common ground. So if you want to get good results in teamwork, always start with, okay, what is the common ground? What, is, what unites us in, instead of what divides us? Um, 
The next thing is, I think, a very important is shared values. It's a thing we did with uh, with uh, with the national team, and and of course, if you if you coach nine or ten years old children, you do it in a different way. You cannot put nine years old around the table and say, okay, let's talk about shared values. They look at you and say, okay, let's do some games or something. But still, you have to think about it, and you have to come to terms. What does shared values mean? It means how do we interact? How do we treat each other? And you have to write it down. With the Dutch national team, we had a list. It wasn't the Ten Commandments, but with a lot of like that. What do people see if they see us as a team? How do we treat each other? How do we act? How do we react? What is value? What is of value for us and what not? Uh, how do we handle these situations? Um, for that uh, is the next step. Uh, if you want a really uh, a commitment of your players for the things you agree upon, you need open communication. And I think even as we speak, we find how hard it is to get open communication. How do you do that? What do you need for, for, for uh, open communication? Trust. You need a safe environment. It's difficult to be open if you don't think the situation that you're speaking up is safe. So as a coach, you have to make sure that even if somebody disagrees what you say or what you think or how do you think we should do things, they still would be uh, brave enough to open up and, and speak up. That's your task as a, as a coach. And the first time you, you, you hit somebody because they tell you something you don't like, well, you can be pretty sure that the next time you ask a question, you won't get an answer. You have a question. I'm afraid, it, I'm not sure it works. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Am I heard? So, uh, I, I have a problem with my current player. Uh, he's very talented. He's left, he's tall. But his understanding of handball is a uh, low level handball. It's third Bundesliga or something. And uh, he would, at that level, it works. Well, this French way, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, you take a ball, you dribble, you try to win the game alone. Well, I'm trying to, uh, to make a team play rather Balkan way, team way, which is obviously a level up of thinking. But the gentleman see that it works in his home team. He's probably the strongest kid in the school. And he says, why don't we play one-on-one? -on -one? And he's pretty stubborn. And my question is, when your player is obviously not understanding something or refusing to understand something, and you don't have many chances to explain it because this level of thinking is uh, still not available to the player, how do you deal with this situation? You cannot just command, you would want to convince, but it seems to be impossible because he won't get it. So what, what do you do? Um. Interesting is that um, then we go back to the first slide and I asked you why are you a coach? Because if you're coaching this player, any player I'm coaching, it is my job, it's my task, it's my role in the process to find a way to reach out to this person to make him understand or be aware of his qualities but also well, his non-qualities, and, and, and find a way to, to make him clear and ask him maybe how he sees his own development. And if you ask him the questions that maybe concern the topics that you are telling him now, maybe. I, can, I don't know this player, so I cannot I, I give it the, the proper answer, but the most important thing is that you have to level up with this player. And as long as you're in this connection, it will be difficult because he wants to prove a point and you want to prove a point and you get a fight. Yeah, it doesn't really get to a point of a fight. What, what I'm saying is that many of my colleagues probably have that problem that the contemporary handball shows you rather uh, examples of bad handball thinking. If you take yesterday game, France against Brazil, they play one-on-one. -on -one. It's a pretty, pretty primitive way of playing. 
and some of your players, they look at that and say, oh, that's how I should play. So it's a systematic, very serious problem that we many, many of us can encounter. You can try to teach people to play uh, intellectual handball if you want, a team handball. And the contemporary handball shows you very, very primitive handball. So how do you deal with that? They see the oh. example, they try to follow it, and it's pretty hard to convince them that this is wrong. So, uh, yeah, okay. In fact, what you say is that the influence of watching, uh, in this case, the French handball team, has more impact on the team as at the things you want to achieve with them, and they want to go their way. Well, that's why I said, okay, it's a good thing that you have an idea of, okay, this is how I would like to play handball. Um, but if you have a team that doesn't agree, or maybe just maybe just one, well, you, you, you sit, it's a team sport. So if we talk about common goal and strategy, or about shared values, I got, uh, some points below it's clear, and matching tasks and roles, who does what in a team, on court and off court. You, you come to terms of agreement with your team. And if one player says, okay, but I don't want to do that, then he, in fact he says, I don't want to be a part of the team. That is the, the, but that is the ultimate consequence. Well, I can tell you this. Um, in 2011, we had a world championship in Brazil. And after that, uh, one of the best players of the team was no longer in the national team because of things that happened there. I won't go into detail, but it had to do with the way she behaved and the way she went into everything, against everything we had committed ourselves as a team. That's the choice of the player. But first you have to come to an agreement. And then if somebody says, well, I don't want that, okay. And the rest of the team wants it, okay. I always think as a team you are stronger than one individual. But... Uh, um, it's, it's the ultimate solution to expel, especially if it's somebody with quality. So I think it, it, it deserves all the possible uh, ways of trying to, get, to keep him aboard. But if not, well, okay, then the team will continue playing and he might uh, find a better place at another club or another situation. Okay? So that's about open communication. Make sure they tell you what they want, what they think. Ask you the things they want to know, uh, and also to each other. Uh, if you look at the development of, of our national team, it was not just the ambition that that became uh, reachable, but they also had to develop as a team. And for that, the hardest thing I've learned for uh, is the difference between men and women's team. I've I've noticed. Hardest thing for, for a women's team that, that starts from enthusiasm and ambition and you reach a top level. But at some point, you have to tell the truth also to each other. Not just to the coach, but also, and that's not always easy because you're also friends. And, but you need it. If you want to have a top performance, the things that has to be said, they, they have to be said. And somebody has to do it. And it cannot always be the coach. And you have to do it also in the locker room. And that's the one big difference I told you this afternoon. Between coaching men and women, I can go into the locker room. That's not moments. Uh, but that's where a lot of things are being said. And it should be said. And the open communication is not just from the players to me or from me to the players, but it's also amongst each other. And it's also in our staff. We, I coach the national team, but we do it with another team. That's our staff. I had two co-trainers, and they were uh, as stubborn as me. They were outspoken. They told me when they thought I was wrong. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I asked them in, in, in the staff, because if I do it alone, it's only my mind that works. If I have six people who are qualified for their job in the staff, and they have their opinions, and they share them, and they give, they give me information of value, I can, we can make better decisions. Because it's not only my head that's working, it's six people working. Or even, at the end, it was nine people in the staff. But for that, it's the next thing. You have to be, if, if you work with the team, you need uh, to define who does what. What are the roles, what are the tasks you have, and... and uh, they have to be clear to everybody, and they have to be matching 
the qualities of the person that has to execute these tasks. I can. Uh, I mean, you had a question this afternoon about the wing player coming inside. Well, if the wing players expect to shoot, but she can't shoot or he can't shoot, then I ask the wrong things. So that's why it's important also for you to know your players. What can they do? What can't they do? See their potential and challenge them to reach it. And then give them a task and give them a role. And I think if you talk about development of players, I find it's very good to give them a task that's a little bit out of reach. They have to make another step to reach it. Not too far away, because then they might get frustrated, but you have to challenge them to go beyond their comfort zone, go beyond the things they already know, and that's how they grow. Um, okay, the next thing I've in, in line is, is uh, I said, is regular evaluation. Um, not just when things go wrong, if we lose a match, everybody's sad and everybody's thinking, what have, could we have done better? But also if you win, because we know why we lose, because we analyze it, we, we, we sit together and we look video. But if we win, most of the time we celebrate. And we forget to make a good analysis, because we have to also to look, what have, we done, what have we done right? What was the, the strategy that made us win? And it will help us more. Because also there is where your mindset is, your actions will follow. So if you want to build a winning mindset, you have to talk a lot about the games you win and why did we win. Was it a tactical thing? Was it technical? Was it physical? What was it? Was it mental? And the next point is maybe the, the, the most difficult part of it, and I think that's where, uh, where your player comes in place, is accepting. Accepting... Uh, the goal, the strategy, the way we work, the values, accepting that other people are different from you. That's why they're called other people. Um, accepting your own task and fulfilling them. So acceptance is a big issue. And you have to look in your team if things don't work well. Where is the problem? Don't they like their job? Do they think we should have different goals? Uh, are we not communicating on the right way or whatever? And you'll see it in the way they, they interact. So acceptance, they have to accept uh, their role in the team, the, the exchange players. I mean, the, the, the top players, well, they will play uh, 45 minutes out of 60. In a tournament, that's, uh, they, they were, I think Karabatic was happy with the match yesterday, that he could sit on the bench uh, the second half and uh, rest a little bit for other important matches that will follow. Um, but you don't know, it's an assumption. Maybe he would have liked to play 60 minutes, I don't know. I, I don't know him that well. And the last thing is, is appreciation and reward. It's one thing, you, is an instrument you use as a coach and it should be appropriate to the, to the, uh, to the performance. If you praise somebody too much for something that is in fact an easy task, it doesn't work so well. But if you don't praise a person, even when he's working hard and doing well, but he never gets your attention, or he, does, he gets underpaid. At some point, you'll get that his, his objective will become more important than the team objective. And like I said, the team objective versus the individual objective, this struggle is causing the team dynamics most of the time. If you have problems with the managers, because they have a different objective than the coach or the players. I uh, fully agree of what's written in here, but I'm missing a canvas or a backdrop because uh, you're talking a lot about communication. Eh? You, can't, uh, you can't put a goal without communication. You can't have uh, shared values without communicating with, mm -hmm. the, uh, with, the, uh, with the girls in your, in your position. But depending on the source, of course, eh, 50 to 70 percent of, of all communication is about influencing. So. I agree what you're writing, but we need to be sure, in my opinion, that getting 100% of open communication is just an illusion. Yes, I agree. Getting 100% of shared values 
you won't get all everything uh, that that oh. that everything will be shared and that they, they agree. No. That's that's yeah. the only that's a remark which I make that I think there is communication. And if we know it, I, I like better to make everything explicit instead of implicit yeah. by saying, okay, there is influence, then we can manage. Otherwise, we can't. Yes, yes. I, I, this is uh, on this list. It, it's not all everywhere a hundred percent. Yeah, that's, that's I it. agree totally. That's an, an, an idealistic view. Uh, you can dream on if you think that will happen. But I use these points because what I do when I work with the team, I observe. I see, I listen, I feel, and you see when things are going well or not going well. Um, and these are the topics I just touch when I speak with them, when I look at them, when I hear how they speak with each other. And then you might get an idea of why things are going right or going wrong. And then you can address these topics and try to raise them from 40% to 70%. But it will be hardly ever 100%. We agree. Yeah. So it's, this, is, this is not uh, something that you have to say in the end, I have 100% at, at, at every point. But you have to work on it to be as open as possible. That means you have to create an environment that is as safe as possible for the players to express what they think, what they feel, because we already agreed that uh, defining your objectives, you do that together with your team. But if they're not open, how big is the chance that the objectives that you have are really the objectives of the team? And if they're not, you will get a problem somewhere in the season or in the tournament. Because they get frustrated. And then you have, you have the, the individual goals towards the, the team goal. Um, and here is something uh, I, I just wanted to share to most, some of you will, will know it already. If you want to uh, coach teams, we, I, I talked about it's not just about you, it's also about who am I coaching and what is their need. If you, if you find troubles, if you look at the, the, the situational leadership model, it says, okay, sometimes you, you, do, you tell people what to do. Other time you, you sell them, you convince them that what you think is right. I think that was what the gentleman just was, was in, in this situation with the player. If they get a, at a higher level, you don't have to tell them. I think the players like Karabatis, you don't have to tell them how to play handball. They know. You give them a task, you let them do it. You talk maybe about different things, about managing in the team, being your, uh, part of, 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 of this tournament, how to de develop in this tournament. So you have to be able as a coach to, to approach different players in a different way. Not just by their character, but also by their level of play. And there is, I think that was one of the, the, the issues with your players, that his idea of his level of play is a different idea than that you have. And then you have a discussion. And that you should agree upon or, or uh, at some point you will uh, part. And everybody has a, a preference. If you look at, at, at the, the sign, it, it, can you read it or not? Is it too, too small, the, the very small? OK. Bottom, from your side, bottom right, it says telling. It's instruction. It's a way of, of, of leadership. The next one is selling. It's on the top right, where you... Where you uh, not just tell, but you have to convince people that because they have starting to get their own opinions. Uh, the next one is participating. You're more on a more or less equal basis talking about what they should do and how they should do it. And the last one is delegating. You say, okay, this is your job, go ahead. I have full confidence that it will work. And these, everybody of us has a, has a, a preference. They, have, they like the one better than the other, or you go there automatically. Think about you, if you go to coaching a new team, what do you do first? Do you tell? Or are you starting to negotiate with them? Or just, are you delegating already? It tells you a lot about what, what's your favorite style. But be aware that you need maybe all four. And if you work with players, I've played, uh, worked with the national team now for eight years. Some of them have only had me as a national coach. So also for them it was good, there was a the change of coach. <laughs> Uh, but you have to change the approach with this player in, in the course of time. Because they develop, they get more qualified. So I can't treat a 30-year-old experienced player like a 21-year-old. 
But when I started with some of the players, they were 21 and now they're 29. And they have evolved, so I have to change my approach to these players also. And the other one, I think, I, it's important for a, for a coach. It's a, it's a model that says, okay, I'll, uh, it, it's, it's about uh, what people know of you and what you know of yourself. Uh, it's called the Yohari window. You can look it up on the internet. It's a model uh, which will help you to understand why feedback is important. Because other people can see things of you. You see things of me now that I don't know about myself. And if you don't tell me, I will never know. And same goes the other way around. And I know things about myself that you don't know. And if you want to work together, it's good to be open because you have more space to work with together. So I have to open up and you have to tell me what you see. And if you want to cooperate, that will help us. That's what this is good for, to make it clear why it's important to have feedback, why it's important to have in your staff critical people that tell you when you're wrong or when they think you're wrong. Okay, and, and, and of course, what, what can we do as a coach to make a difference? There are a lot of pictures here. Um, in the center, it says take personal responsibility. I am responsible for my actions, for the quality of my performance, um, nobody else. But I need activity, I need to do things, that's on, on, the, on the top left. Then enthusiasm. If I'm not enthusiastic about my work, about the game, about my team, they won't listen to me. Set goals, give feedback. Uh, stamina, is a keep on going on. Check. If, if, if the things you, you discussed, the things you agreed upon, are still uh, in place. Pushing and pulling and, and, and helping the players, it says metacognition, to step outside of their, uh, their state of mind, which might help the, this player of, of, of him upstairs to help him think about his own development. Maybe he'll look in a different way to his own um, performance. Okay, there's not just a test because we will eat, the, I think, after the final presentation. But if you want to have success as a team, um, it requires commitment. And commitment is, uh, is easy spoken. Yes, I'm committed. But there's a, there's a fine line between commitment and involvement. That's why I have this picture with uh, ham and eggs. I think that the chicken is involved and the pig is committed. That's, that's the difference. And, and, but from this commitment, if we talked about the tasks and the roles and the values we have in the team, there are consequences for the player, for me, for my behavior, for what I do and how I do it. And after that, there's consistency. Then I have to watch, okay, this is what we agreed upon. This is, they have shown commitment. This is what we do. And do they really behave that way? Or is this a different picture? Am I talking about coaching or am I also acting like it? That's, that's uh, different. Therefore, you need consciousness. You need the courage to ask questions or, or say the things you, you think. And for that, you need self-confidence. These are things you have to, have to look for in, in, in a team and in yourself. How confident are you to tell your president to go somewhere else when he's telling you uh, his opinion about why you lost and, and what your role was in that? Uh, you need a lot of confidence for that. I think we, we have a, a, had a lot of time for questions. I don't know if there are any questions now, because I, uh, some people already are moving and getting nervous because Mats Olsen is starting in a few minutes with his goalkeeper presentation. Do we have any last minute questions? If I was at an auction, I wouldn't sell anything. Okay. In one? I think uh, having more than one captain is an illusion. There's always one captain. There is one person, and of course, if you're the coach, there's one person who makes the final decision, and that should be you. If you don't, because you, you'll get fired for making the wrong decisions. So you, you, you don't have two, two captains on a team. There's always one.
Okay. Okay. Because uh, they, well, the vous captain plaît, is, 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 is uh, you talk about the roles in a team, and if you work with a team, uh, it's not always easy for players to approach the coach, the head coach, with issues that are there. And it shouldn't be always the, the case that the, 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 the coach also is the police officer who controls everything. Because, but the players amongst each other, they know a lot more than the coach. And for that, it's important to have a captain who understands the players, but also understands the coach. He's an intermediate between the, the, the team and, and, and the coach, uh, and he can help you, or not, if you have the wrong captain. No, I do, do agree, but you mentioned there's only one captain on the boat, and which is, uh, I, yes. you, I, you f I fully agree, which you are yourself, but yeah. the only thing is uh, the name is the same, because yes. in, within the players. Nevertheless, to give just an answer, there is a survey, uh, or a scientific survey, made in uh, the Université of uh, Leuven, where uh, they did an investigation of all, over 100 teams, and only in... Uh, they tell that the, there is in 99 percentage of the teams a shared responsibility over the different uh, teams, and so they have different in they have unspoken different captains. But we can discuss about it. Yeah. Okay. That that will be a complex situation. Indeed. But that is about you, you talk about different topics. You can say, okay, if we divide the tasks and the roles within the team, everybody is a captain for his own responsibility. But in the end, there's one person yeah, who is yeah. responsible, and especially and in that sports. we fully agree. So and, and and if I am responsible because I'm getting paid to do my job as a coach, I want to make damn sure that uh, I agree with what's happening. Yeah. If not, I have to leave. And there we agree, yeah. But, yeah. But, but whatever. F concerning the players, that's different. Yeah, it's different. It's different. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then I have one more slide, I think. Okay. Because you're here and you you look you look and you hear a lot of other coaches. Um, I always tell the coaches, I, I work also for the Johan Cruyff Institute uh, with a master in coaching program, and I tell them, well, don't try to copy other coaches. Try to look for yourself and, and trust, uh, learn to trust yourself. Make sure you, 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 you uh, um, increase your knowledge, increase your technique, increase everything you can or, or will do, and uh, learn to trust it. Because it's your life, it's your career as a coach, it's your team, um, so most of all, trust yourself. If there are no more questions, thank you for your attention. That was it. Thank you. Merci. Merci, merci, Hank. Merci. Thank you, Hank. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Now we'll try and follow your, 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 your advice. Thank you very much.